You're listening to The Struck Podcast. I'm Dan Blewett. I'm Alan Hall. And here on Struck, we talk about everything aviation, aerospace engineering, and lightning protection. All right, welcome back to The Struck Podcast. I'm your co-host, Dan Blewett. On today's show, I've got a lot of actually pretty interesting topics. Number one, we'll chat about NASA. They're, uh, they have a helicopter flight. The ingenuity potentially taking place soon on Mars, which is actually really interesting because of the density of the atmosphere. So that's actually a big challenge. And that'll be the first uh, flight ever taken off from another planet. So pretty cool. Uh, We'll chat about Boeing a little bit. They've had an electrical issue with their 737 MAX. We'll talk about helicopters a bunch in our engineering segment. Uh, recently, last month, a helicopter was struck by lightning, had to make an emergency landing. So we'll talk a little about, a bit about the redundancy systems that go into keeping helicopter uh, travel safe. And then our EV tailwell segment, we got a bunch to talk about on WISC today with a long uh, PDF they put out about the future of air taxis. We'll also talk a little bit about uh, UPS making a purchase from Beta and a couple other thoughts. So, Alan, how you doing, sir? Let's talk NASA. Yeah, this NASA thing is pretty cool, huh? Helicopters on another planet. Yeah, I watched the uh, Wall Street Journal did a great video on this. They featured one of the engineers, uh, the head engineer who was, uh, you know, behind behind the uh, the contractor who was working on this project for NASA. But they were set to go uh, on April 10th, it looks like, um, or, or maybe just early or in April. And then it looks like they're going to not fly until after April 14th. Um, but it seems like they have high hopes and the engineering seems to hold up. They tested this, you know, in a, like a vacuum chamber and (laughs) they seem like they've done all their simulations well, which, uh, obviously one would expect with this being such an important thing, but what's, what's jumps out to you having, you know, seen the engineering video and, and learning a little bit about this, uh, ingenuity, uh, drone. Well, the, the atmosphere of Mars is, uh, less dense and they're just less it's mostly carbon dioxide, right? So mm-hmm. it, the, the atmosphere is less dense, which makes it harder for any sort of lifting body to fly because the way things fly is essentially they're directing, in, in the case of Earth, they're directing the air air down, aircraft up, and, and a helicopter, same sort of thing, rotating blades is pushing, sort of pushing the air down, and it goes up. And in a less dense atmosphere, it's much harder to do. You need much higher angle of attack, and you have to be a little more precise about it. Um, so the, the air environment guys, uh, the only way to test a helicopter like that on on this planet is to actually put it in a vacuum chamber and pull it down and well, fill it with carbon dioxide and then pull it yeah. down. So they got a partial vacuum in it to simulate the atmosphere on Mars. But you can in in a vacuum chamber like that, and it's unique in a sense. And I used to work around those big vacuum chambers when we worked in the space space world years ago is that the air inside of them is well whatever air is inside of them is calm right so you 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 don't have the normal turbulence crosswinds all those kind of things that would come into on a, on mars is one of <laughs> the winds on mars is one of the things you have to deal with so the instability uh, is going to be interesting and, and maybe that's why they're pushing back some of the uh, initial flights of, the, of this helicopter is because they're getting some meteorological data that's telling some information where they can go analyze it and run it through the run it through the simulations to see if they when they can fly it right so you you want to fly it when it's daylight one and you and you also want to fly it when the winds are calm and you don't get up in the air and get tumbled over which would be the worst case scenario so there's there's a lot to it um and I guess, Dan, you know, when any sort of new trial like this, I remember some of the early landings on Mars with some of the spacecraft, they weren't trying to do a whole lot there. They're just trying to get some basic functionality out of the system they were working mm-hmm. with and then get to the next one, right? So like this, what's this, What's the size of this rover that's on Mars right now that they just landed? It's about the size of a car, right? Isn't that the- I, th- I rough- think so, yeah. Versus the first ones, which are the, was it the little Pathfinder one, which is about the size of a, of a remote control car sort of thing. Mm-hmm. So they've grown exponentially. Don't you think that this helicopter experiment, if it does work, is going to get exponentially bigger? That's what the engineer said. He said, yeah, we just want to get data and figure yeah. out where we're going next. And, and you can tell just by the design of this, it's a little box on the bottom with four legs and two <laughs> you know, c- carbon fiber composite rotors things super simple and i think you know it's the yeah. way it was designed to be so 
Um, yeah, this is clearly no, yeah, just no like tail just rotor. The, the, the base starting starting mo uh, you know model. So, but they have counter rotating rotors. Legs, is that right. that's why they don't have um, a, a tail rotor? No tail rotor, right? Yes, because if you have just a, the single rotor, you have to have a tail rotor to count out yeah, the, the, the balance the switching balance forces. It. Yeah, so the the, the counter rotating is probably a lot more compact, also. But I, I, it kind of makes you wonder if if the helicopter does work. Why would you put another driving drone on a planet? You probably wouldn't, uh, mm -hmm. because you're limited as to how far it can traverse. Where with something as mobile as a helicopter, where you can traverse miles in a day to different parts of the planet, that would make infinitely more sense because of how much more data you could gather. In fact, it makes you wonder if they'll, uh, you know, put a, put a series of, of flying vehicles on Mars just to got to get a better sense of the of the planet and and figure out the different parts of the planet and the environments in different parts of the planet. I, I, I think it just opens up so many mo more opportunities than they would have in the past. So it, it's a really cool experiment. Well, isn't that going to be a, a big challenge though? I mean, how far can a drone go on battery power alone, especially when it's going to have to fight a little bit harder to get lift with the, the lighter atmosphere, right? Right. Um, is that going to be, I mean, could this fly a couple miles and come back? I mean, I guess, I don't know. They probably have to put batteries, a pretty big batteries. Oh well, yeah. Yeah, with big enough batteries and solar panels, you could probably do it. You know what? It's a question similar to the aircraft, uh, winged uh, winged aircraft versus helicopters on how far they can fly. Winged aircraft can always fly further. It's much more efficient in flying distances, but you need a place to land, right? So that's a difficulty with it, where a helicopter takes off land. So you're saying the EVTOL segment is going to Mars. That's what it sounds like here. Well, it, it'd be similar, yeah. If, you're, if you want to do something like that, where you can take off and land vertically, but yet traverse miles at a time, then that would be the, that would be the right solution. But obviously, maybe, we maybe a really gyrocopter, to... gyrocopter, oh, yeah. best of both yeah. worlds. Yeah, well, possibly if, they, if if you have enough atmosphere to get enough lift to do it. Yes, you could yeah. you could do that. Yeah. Well, that's an interesting thought as a as a a non engineer, just thinking that yeah, you know, you need to have enough thickness essentially in the atmosphere to like have something to actually push down with your rotors. It's an interesting yeah. thought. Like you just think of you know another planet like. Every, you, just, you just think of the physics of other worlds being the same as on Earth, but they're not. And that's just an <laughs> inter right. interesting thought that it's got to work so much harder to have something to actually shove to, like, yeah. direct, you know, create those forces. So it's interesting. Yeah, it's like swimming in a pool without yeah. any water, right? When, when you have water in there, you can propel yourself. If there's no water, you can't propel yourself. It's roughly that situation. Yeah. So Boeing's had another little hiccup. It sounds like they've grounded some of their jets because of an electrical issue. Um, you know, an article here by CNN Business, uh, basically, like, it looks like 16 customers were asked to address this issue uh, for a safety concern. And it sounds like they only do this where they suggest grounding the plane when it's like relatively potentially catastrophic. Is that correct? I mean, is this a little thing or maybe a bigger thing? It's hard to say because there hasn't been a lot of information out on it yet. If they have an airworthiness directive that goes out from the FAA, that's a little more uh, critical. I mean, they, they can they can ground all the airplanes. FAA can ground all the airplanes and make them do a repair or do or typically do an inspection before they allow them to fly again or give them the very short time window in which they have to do an inspection in. It sounds like this has something to do with an aircraft power ground uh, somewhere on the airplane where they may not have a, a good enough ground. It makes you think mm -hmm. there's just something yeah. missed in manufacturing because it's such an old airplane. There can't be much difference from the previous generation, you wouldn't think. Well, this, so, is, the, this is the 37 Max. This is the brand new one. Yeah. But you're saying the 737 lineage is so old that, gotcha. Right. And the power distribution system is not going to be that much different than it was from the previous generation. It's all okay. derivative, essentially. So if they have some real fundamental issue, it's probably just a manufacturing oversight that they... New employee, missed quality step, missed something in the planning that got overlooked or someone wasn't reading an instrument or they had a, or a piece of calibrated instrument wasn't calibrated properly and was reading a wrong reading. I mean, all those <laughs> relatively simple things come into it because it doesn't sound like it's an engineering thing. No one's screaming engineering made a design error as much as it sounds like it's something they caught on the manufacturing line. And the right thing to do in those situations is to, one, identify, flag it, sort of bring it up the, the, the hierarchical chain of, of 
manufacturing engineering, get it to to someone who can really evaluate it and determine like what does this affect, and then identify all the all the affected airlines and tell them what's happening, and obviously tell the FAA what's going on. Mm-hmm. So it's it's the right move. So even though it shows up in the newspapers as oh look, that's another seven thirty seven issue with the Max. Yes, there is, but this is what you want to have happen because what you don't want to have happen is somebody have an issue on the manufacturing line and ignore it and not tell somebody and then yeah yeah and then there's then there's an error further out so when you're building such a complicated vehicle like a airliner there are always manufacturing escapes of some level you know you don't want any right but but things do happen because it's made by people and it's better that the system is set up to catch those things, identify them, and to inform customers than to not. So I, I you know, there's a lot of gonna be a lot of press about this this week, but I think Boeing is doing the right thing here. Well, and so this is my last question to you before we move on. But how do they 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 catch these? So like when the FAA is like, hey guys, we got to do this. Mm. How did they find that issue? Was it the FAA rooting around? They have their own plane. They just fly around, and when something goes wrong, they well, they scold yeah. everyone. Or, or how how does this stuff get brought to light typically it's not an faa inspector that will identify it's usually a maintenance person at an airline may notice it and inform up the chain of to the eventually the manufacturer what's going on or the the operators or maintenance people or the or the installers on the assembly line see an issue they haven't seen before and they and they raise it right so it's part of that safety structure that's built into the airline business and the airplane business that you if you if you have an issue that seems like it could be a safety issue where it could affect the, the aircraft or the safety of the aircraft they have a reporting system and that sh- that really gets dealt with right so you need to bring more people into it to review it that's how it usually gets caught it's it's not like what People tend to think about there's just FAA inspector with a hat on walking mm-hmm. around the tarmac, you know, tapping on the airplanes, looking into the, looking yeah, that's, with a flashlight that's what around. Want. Yeah, I want an old guy with a wrench just tapping and kicking the tires. That's, <laughs> right. that's what it is that, in my That's head. not how it works, right? So someone who's knowledgeable in that part of the airplane sees uh, an anomaly and flags it. That's usually how it happens. And in a good in, in a good safety environment. The, the employees feel like that's part of their job to flag that stuff and to tell somebody else that's that's yeah. good. In a bad sort of repressive environment where they get beat up for raising issues, that's bad. You don't, you don't want that. But there's also that trade-off too where uh, like happens during union disputes where the maintenance workers start flagging everything. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's that also brings into a safety risk also because you can't filter out the, the noise from the real real stuff right so you know it, it it really is people working with people that's what it comes down to safety is really comes down to people working with people all right so on our engineering segment today we're going to talk a bunch about helicopters so uh last month a offshore helicopter was uh forced into an emergency landing this reporting from energyvoice.com uh, off the coast of Scotland, so uh, the Shetland Coast Guard, um, they had to make an emergency landing after getting struck by lightning. So, obviously, Alan, there's been you know with Kobe Bryant's death, um, you know, early last year, and uh, you know it's, and then of course, um, you know, uh, the member of the Dassault family earlier, uh, just a couple months ago, you know, like helicopters and their safety records come into question. And just or really just brought into the spotlight. So obviously mm-hmm. there's a lot l- maybe less redundancy with just the rotor system, um, but obviously there's still plenty of redundancy in there, right? These are yeah. well built machines in general. Yes. But take us through, you know, what happens with a lightning strike with helicopters because we haven't talked a lot about it, about it here. And then what, um, what what's the general state of safety for helicopters? Well, the aircraft that got struck was a Sikorsky S ninety two, and I did some of the lightning testing on that aircraft and it was being developed and i was happened to crawl around that aircraft for probably a week or more uh when the the certification testing was going on so i have a sense of that aircraft it's a relatively large helicopter and Mm -hmm. it's meant for mostly shuttling large groups of people to and from offshore oil platforms that's one of its prime missions so it's it's just this really robust yeah and in this article 
it said there are 14 people on board. That's a lot of right. a lot of people. Yeah. 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 So it it has some of the most advanced uh, maintenance systems and avionic systems and power plant and technology in it because it's a relatively new helicopter. The the I think the issue comes about in this particular case where in the North Sea, particularly this time of year, sort of winter time, the lightning strikes can be big. I and mean, I, I mean big. They've had helicopters get severely damaged and land in the water out there uh, back in the 90s. So there is always a concern, and the pilots all know about those things typically. And if you're if you're in a, a helicopter, which even though this is a larger helicopter, it's still feels like you're in like a basically a large minivan or a large van uh so like a 20 passenger van kind of thing and if the lightning strike is big enough it'll scare the living heck out of you <laughs> and it, it will i mean it because they have huge lightning strikes out there so they probably took a very a, a relatively larger lightning strike and maybe spooked the pilots and, and not so much spooked in terms of scared of like, hey, let's let's just be on the safe side. Let's let's declare an emergency and make sure everybody knows where we're at. In case mm -hmm. something were to happen to the aircraft before we could get to land, they would be tracking us so they could come find us because it does have life rafts and all the accoutrements to land in the in the water. So it's more like a tracking thing than it is a safety of the aircraft issue. You, you, you want someone to know where you're at because the North Sea is really cold and you're not yeah. going to live out there very long. So you want somewhere, somewhere to come find you. That That's most of it. But the technology in that S-92 is amazing. Um, it's really amazing. It has a number of systems that health maintenance systems that sort of predetermine when you're going to have a, when you need to do some advanced ma maintenance. So it's sort of catching things before they get to a serious state. Um, there's a lot of, uh, just a, I can't describe them all because, but there, there's a lot, there's a lot of advanced features in that, in that aircraft. So it, it's a really, really safe aircraft, honestly. Well, so in, in this interesting article by uh, NPR, which was released back, uh, you know, January of last year, you know, they just talk about the incident rates. You know that the fatal accident rate of helicopters is right. Well, at least in, in 2018 was 0 0.72 per hundred thousand flight hours, and of course with like commercial aviation. It could be zero for a year, right? There might not be any right. major plane crashes in a year, which yeah. is great. Um, and of course, if you compare that to driving in a car, which is fundamentally different, um, you know, Americans spend 51 minutes on average in a car each day. So there's a, a ton more contact time with, a v right. you know, being at a vehicle with other vehicles that could crash into you through no fault of your own, <laughs> lots of other things, right? Yeah. There's so much more. It's really hard to compare the two things because in a helicopter or in a commercial airliner, it's not really a an, an issue that you're going to crash into another thing, right? Like not really. No, um, no. But no. if you're driving down the street just now, you have to actively avoid lots of other people who could not be working as hard to actively avoid you. They could be texting, <laughs> right. you know, all sorts of stuff. So yeah. very interesting differences there. But uh, obviously hel helicopters do have a, a, a higher um, fatality rate. And then it says in this NPR article that personal or private rides account for uh, just 3% of flight hours, but more than a quarter of fatal accidents. Sure. So what, what do you, how do you explain some of the differences here? And I mean, it, you know, you think of just this one rotor and that if the engine shuts off, the thing just falls out of the sky like a rock, but that's not exactly the case all the time. There's auto rotation. Is that right? There's like some right. things they can do. Sure. They, they have, they have techniques to, to get on the ground relatively safely uh, with auto rotation, just free rotating of the blades uh, and changing the pitch of the blades as you get close to the ground. The, the issue from the sort of private pilot to the commercial pilot is the bigger disparity. If you're piloting your own aircraft or driving your own car, we've all been there at some point where we want to get home. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that seems to be the big driver. So if, I, if it's midnight and I'm driving across Kansas, and I got two more hours to go, do I pull over and call it a day or do I drive the two hours? And most people will tend to drive the two hours. That's what'll yeah. happen. And the same thing happens on aircraft and helicopters where they're in a situation where they're trying to beat the weather, they're trying to beat the time clock, it's starting to get dark and that rate of for 
for VF, uh, IFR flight and they're flying into IFR conditions or near IFR conditions and they get themselves in trouble and they crash. That tends to happen more on the uh, private side. If I'm the owner and I'm driving, I'm flying the thing, uh, that more, more likely to happen than if I'm a corporate or a professional pilot where it's a job, right? Mm-hmm. It's a job. I don't have to be anywhere. I'm going to try to help my client but I'm not gonna risk that client's life, right? So when I bring a second person into it, I think the dynamics change. And the professional pilots also have tend to have more flight hours and tend to have a lot more training in general, in general. So you don't get yourselves into those, those situations. And I think that's where you see the disparity. There's a lot of get home, what they call get home-itis that goes mm-hmm. on. And that drives a lot of accidents I, I think it's a, sort of the same thing when you're driving a car. If you if you're in a car and it's late and you're by yourself, you're going to take more risk than if you have your kids in the back. That's just the yeah. way that it goes, right? So it's sort of a human nature thing. I literally rolled my my Jeep in high school because <laughs> I was in trouble. It was very late at night. It's a long story, but I was in trouble, so I was trying to get home faster. Took a curve too fast that I knew my car, my Jeep was not capable of making. It was like a really hairpin you know, state, like a state park back road. And I should have slowed down. And normally I would have, but I didn't at that point. I didn't slow down enough. And I was like, oh man, you shouldn't have done. And then I felt my tires slide a little bit. And then I counter steered and poof, I was on my roof before I even knew it. That was it, it. right. (laughs) So I can relate to this. so fast. Well, and they also, the the big remark with like, um, what is it, uh, tightrope walkers, is that most of them fall in the last tiny, like the last 10 feet or something. Really? Because they've, They've done the whole thing and they're very focused and now they're so close, like they can see the end that they start losing focus on their craft and focus on the end. Like I'm almost done. There it is. I can see it. Let's just get there. Whereas those last six feet when you're hovering, you know, many feet like above the building. And this was something that the, um, if you've ever seen that documentary about the guy who walked between, was it between the two skyscrapers in New York? I don't remember if it was yes. between the Twin Towers. Yes, but the Twin Towers, he talked, yes. He, he talked about that. He said, people like experienced tightrope walkers don't fall in the middle. He said they fall at the end. He said, because wow. you feel like you've done it already, but you're not done. And those, and any foot could kill you. Any step could kill you, whether it's the first one, the middle thousandth step, or the very last step. It's the same, you know, consequence of you missing that step right he said you know when they get to the end they lose their focus because they see it and they think they're done and they're not so wow same kind of thing so it's sort of a human nature thing yeah that's interesting Mm -hmm. i didn't know that but yeah i guess uh okay so helicopters obviously you know like i said they've been brought in the spotlight in this past year especially with a couple of high profile deaths but you know it sounds like they're not as unsafe as maybe no and and the the maintenance on them is the maintenance and the design of of helicopters and rotorcraft have gotten so much better over the last 20 30 years there's so much better technology into them much better materials there's much more maintenance going on much better everything that you just the safety record is really good for what it is All right, so moving on to our EVTOL segment today. Uh, first, let's start with uh, some good news. So UPS purchases uh, some of Beta's uh, aircraft, which if you look at the the Beta EVTOL, it really just looks like a helicopter with a big, you know, contraption on top to support multiple, you know, electric rotors, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Um, it's a pretty cool design. So UPS is purchasing, uh, you know, up to, it says up to 150 is reporting from Aviation Today. Uh, mm-hmm. But they'll get their maybe their first ten by 2024, which is still you know three years off, um, and of course subject is still certification, all that all that other stuff. Sure. Um, but UPS seems excited about it that they're going to be able to integrate this into their business and provide better value for their customers. And it's unclear to me what they're going to transport in them because it doesn't yeah. seem like they have tremendous cargo capacity. Right. Um, you know, but I don't know. We'll, we'll have to see what what kind of stuff the UPS plans to do with it. But um, how do you feel about Beta's design? I mean, does that seem like a good fit for for UPS? I don't know if it's a great fit for UPS quite yet because we haven't seen a lot about the lifting capabilities of the aircraft. Obviously, mm-hmm. the design makes a lot of sense. Uh, I think they're going in the right direction in, in a lot of ways on the aircraft design and trying to hit their where their expertise expertise is and then 
sort of lets the suppliers do a lot of the other things that happen with an aircraft or use your supplier's expertise to get the aircraft to certification faster. That all makes sense to me. Uh, the UPS exposure and the, the press from UPS is interesting in that uh, UPS obviously thinks there's some routes they can cover with the aircraft and, and maybe it has to do with quick delivery of, of uh, packages or short routes that are happening. Uh, th there's a, there's a variety of different things, but I think from a UPS perspective, they want to try new technology to see if there's any applications. It's sort of like the drone uh, drone packaging, where they're using drones to move, I think FedEx is using drones to move packages in Memphis at their own terminal from like terminal mm -hmm. one end of the terminal to the other. So they're playing around with technology to see where it goes because you don't want to be left out if the technology takes off and you happen to find paying customers for it, you don't want to be left out. So you, you want to dabble in it enough to get it moving and, and getting to the next stage, to the certification stage, obviously and then test it out. And then if it does work, then just keep buying more and more of them, right? I, I think that's probably where they're going. You know, FedEx is in the middle of having a twin turboprop high wing airplane designed by Textron, uh, which is gonna be reaching certification, I think in 2021 or 2022, it's, it's in flight testing right now. So I can't think it's that far off. Mm -hmm. It's the same sort of thing where it's, it's just an efficient, uh, relatively i wouldn't say a short hauler but can haul a lot of cargo repeatedly get it in get it out get the airplane off uh sort of fedex designed airplane and fedex hasn't been too much in the design of airplanes but it looks like they've had a lot of say in this particular textron airplane so you, you may see more and more of the air of the haulers the ups's the fedex's of the world and, and the amazons of the world which is starting their own sort of delivery airline service, having more say about what actually happens on the design aspects, that's going to be probably the bigger play. FedEx has been mm. involved, obviously, with this Textron one and has helped. They buy a lot of Boeing airplanes, so I'm sure they're talking to Boeing about things they want cargo-wise to happen in the airplane. I would say UPS has done that too, but this electric technology opens up more doors to them to try new things. And they have engineering departments, pretty substantial engineering departments, these these airline companies, movers, UPSs and FedExs of the world, they have really good engineering departments that have made a lot of advancements in aircraft technology and aircraft safety internally to their own companies, which mm -hmm. the outside observer wouldn't really notice, but they do. So they have a lot of aircraft knowledge. They know what they're talking about, and they, and they know what the customer routes are and where they make money. And um, if you can have some say in the aircraft design early on, then that could be very, very beneficial to you as, as a shipper. It helps you just save money overall. So let's, let's transition here to, uh, to whisk. So whisk has been in the news recently They're Um, well, they have some litigation pending on a, a patent infringement with, uh, Archer, which we won't get into today, but they've been in the news a couple of different avenues, but I want to talk about their right. new paper, uh, on autonomous, uh, UAMs, you know, and it's titled taking mobility to new heights. <laughs> And, you know, so this is basically in four chunks, this, this PDF section one talks about commuters, uh, section two about, um, autonomous EVTLs and consumer interest. And then part three, you know, it fitting into people's lives and then, you know, their, their vision for the future after that. Um, mm. but to me, this read as like a puff piece that just talks about how fun and great air, you know, EVTOLs can be for commuters to not have to commute because they essentially, I'll read you the demographics. They had a, a research company do this sort of um, uh, survey study for them and people aged 21 to 65 living in one of the top 30 DMA markets. So like the big, um, you know, like Denver main, you know, their main area, DC main area, whatever. Um, mm -hmm. 75,000 plus per year income, currently employed, commute once a week, 30 plus minutes, um, open mind, positive attitude towards planes, helicopters, electric vehicles, et cetera, mm -hmm. not employed in an adjacent industry. So no one from the, I don't know, petroleum industry would probably be uh, in this included in here. But so anyway, people who are making decent money, open-minded about electric vehicles who obviously hate their commute everyone hates their commute no matter how long it is for the most part so right <laughs> um you know and, and but it, to me this again did it kind of read like a business plan like a college sophomore would make 
and maybe this was their intent that it's just very surface level but top level yeah if you're if you're just talking about and you're polling people about why they hate their commute and if they hate their commute and if you if they'd like a solution for their commute <laughs> like who wouldn't answer yes like hey dan would you like to not commute 45 minutes absolutely would you like to take a plane sure that sounds wonderful um right. you know like what else what you know like what would you do if you're commuting in a plane dan well i'd look out the window and i'd ch check my email like there's quotes about that and stuff in, in this thing um <laughs> and it it just it doesn't seem like those all seem like obvious good things about having an electric taxi take you to work but sure. it didn't seem to address any of the things that people would ask which are well how safe are these what happens right. if one crashes it's like right. hey dan uh you commute an hour every day you just heard that a evtl crashed and landed on some people on the street below many fatalities would you want to take an evtl after that uh maybe not you know um because there's going to be incidences like cars crash commercial Airlines airliners crash, crash heli right. helicopters crash everything crashes sure. sure so that's a you know the safety thing is a huge huge problem yeah. um just going forward and the, the press involved in it and then the fitting into people's lives you know talking about you know if you have to go to a hell a little helipad or vertiport whatever they call it right you know hey i'm here you check in you do all this stuff i mean how big of a commute alan do you think you have to have to actually even save time when you have to do the check-in fly and then hop out and like yeah. you said it's um it's not going to be right next to your house right i think I, I think you have to have at least a 45 minute commute maybe an hour long commute before it starts to make sense but uh i think there's really two big drivers in this one is what is the cost going to be mm -hmm. right so even if say you have that hour commute, not, not cheap cut. not cheap for sure I, I i don't think i don't think so but there's a convenience factor so it, you got to weigh that in your time is valuable so it'll save you some time and maybe that trade-off is worth it. The second, I think, is probably the more important piece early on is most people haven't flown in a small aircraft. And it's not like flying in a 737 or an A320. That's a totally different feel to it because you're going to feel every bit of turbulence. You're going to feel that a lot more acceleration mm -hmm. and deceleration. And uh, it's a closer environment. So if you're... If you don't think you're claustrophobic on a 737, but when you, you're in something that's much, much smaller, you're going to start to feel it. And particularly since you don't have any control when you're flying, especially as a passenger and a small aircraft, you feel like you don't have any control. And that, that sense of un, that unsettling sense starts to creep up in your gut like this doesn't feel right. And for a lot of people, that's enough to say, I'm not doing it anymore. It's like yeah. taking that roller coaster ride. You, you know, you're standing on the ground watching the roller coaster go and go. Yeah, I could do that. But when you get in that roller coaster car mm -hmm. and it starts to click, click, click up the hill, it's like, man, I want, I don't want to be here anymore. I think there's going to be a good part of that coming into play. And so, asking somebody on the street what they think about shortening the com commute, everybody's going to say yes to that. Mm -hmm. Not, not throwing a price range out it has. <laughs> it seems to me it's like, you know, playing around a little bit because if you said it's a thousand dollars to save you 15 minutes, people are going to go no, right? If it's $5, yeah. people are going to say yes, right? So there's a price point in there, but I do think that you just don't know what flying in a small aircraft is like until you've done it. And is it for you or not for you? Because there's, there's a significant part of the population, probably 50%, maybe more that don't want to feel that way and don't think it's cool and won't do it, right? So that's, a, that's a interesting, yeah, a good insider point of view because I hadn't thought about that. And then that's, I'm sure, spot on that a lot of people be like, I don't like this. I don't like this. I'd rather get right. back in my car, rather people right. cutting me off and give me the finger and then, yeah. Right. But I can stop the car and get out whenever I want to, which is part of my thing when I fly is like, there's times mm -hmm. when I could fly, but I go, you know, it's not that far and I would prefer to stop and take a break and not be locked mm -hmm. in with a mask on the whole thing on an airplane flight. 
and I'll I'll drive instead. Even though it's more risky, I feel like there's a little more independence to it, and I'm in control of the situation. On an airline, you never feel like you're in control. Right? You just don't. Well, that's still the bottleneck is the uh, where do you get on and where do you get off? Because yeah. if, if you're a commuter and you're like, okay, my commute's 45 minutes or say, it, let's say it's even an hour. If you're not within 15 minutes of a vertiport, I mean, is it going to be worth your time at that point? I, right. You know, it's I like don't taking know. the train on the East Coast. Because yeah, right? you got to drive there or take an Uber there or take your bike get, there. But if you're in the you're, parking lot, mm-hmm. walk over to the to the train station to the platform yeah wait (laughs) right Mm -hmm. nothing ever happens fast there you have to get there early so you don't miss it make sure you have a parking spot bing bang boom all of a sudden it's just like taking a train any vtl doesn't have that sort of feel i mean it's not being advertised like that but essentially what it's going to boil down to is going to be like taking a train on some level you got to get to there get to the place pay the parking walk it to the platform get a ticket or do it on your app wait for the aircraft to get there waiting line probably much like a disney world ride for the guy in front of you to take his flight off somewhere to the next one comes in that's what it's going to end up being and is it worth it i don't know yeah and there's going to have to be you know like pretty strict controls as far as like you couldn't have you know a set of golf clubs with you if you needed them like for after work you know you get, like there's they're gonna have to know how much each passenger weighs i would assume maybe maybe not roughly but oh, there's roughly. gonna be a payload issue you know that payload sure. is important um yeah it just seems difficult rather than just like okay my car is a hover car i'm gonna go outside get it and fly off like blade runner to work that would be right. much more realistic maybe but and, and then, like you said, I mean, is this a commuter thing where it's like you can actually afford this five days a week, 20 of these flights a month? I mean, if it was Don't 50 know. bucks, if it was 50 bucks both ways, that's a thousand bucks a month. If it's 50 bucks one way, right. which I'm sure is on the low end of what this would probably cost, especially initially. Now you're talking two thousand dollars a month. You know, it's a hundred dollars a day for 20 commutes. You know, you've got to be an executive some with a pretty, pretty good disposable income to say that's worth it to me. Right. That's that's true. It, I part of me f- is feeling like on the EVTL space, they're, they're, they're pushing San Francisco and Silicon Valley as a place with high incomes and a lot of places you can possibly land. And there's it has that feel to it, like the, the financial aspects could work itself out and maybe there's enough quote unquote risk takers that they would want mm-hmm. to do something like this same thing on sort of in the, the new york area also but in other places where um oh, china obviously china i mean i mean china is a place where there's a lot of congestion and there's a lot of pollution um and they're trying to clean it up does the american ev tall market just shift to there maybe brazil same sort of thing Right. A lot of helicopters are used in Brazil right now for a variety of reasons. London, where you have taxes to fly, to drive into the city, you have to pay a tax. Well, maybe you don't have to pay a tax if you, quote unquote, fly an electric vehicle. And those are kind of your opportunities. But I do think they're limited right now. And it may not be in the United States. If the aircraft price is more than roughly a half million dollars, I think they're going to have trouble selling it to the general pilot population in the States. Mm -hmm. That will be, I think, difficult. But there are other places on the planet where it may make sense. So is a marketplace truly in the United States or or they think a little more broader? And and that's my guess is that they're thinking broader, that there's other places in the world where this thing may fit. That's an interesting thought. Yeah. And it would be, I mean, I I think these, as far as like little commuter planes, if you own, like you said, you own your own EVTOL, is that a lot safer for you traveling in than a you know a small whether it's a Cessna or any other type of small personal aircraft? You know, Don't maybe know maybe more maybe. convenient, maybe not. Like yeah, maybe. but that's also an interesting market. If you live in, you know, if you lived on on Long Island and you want to commute to Manhattan, could you fly that 150 miles? You know, there's a lot of wealthy people out there, obviously. Yeah. Would that be a good solution for you? Maybe. Yeah. There's engineers that do that in the aerospace world that they if they're if they're place of employment is near the airport or at the airport and they live out in the country a lot of times these (laughs) crazy engineers will have their own uh runway in an airplane and they'll they'll fly to work i've seen that many times in the aerospace people will fly to and from work they make that daily commute via airplane if the weather's good if the weather's not good then they're driving but they will do that 
So there is that marketplace, but they're not buying an aircraft for they're buying an aircraft for a hundred, two hundred thousand dollars. They're not buying an aircraft that's over five hundred thousand dollars to a million dollars. You know, they're yeah. buying a little single engine Piper Cessna beach airplane to do those runs in. And that's that's the right price point to do that. You can't make that million dollars up or two or four or five million dollars up flying to and from work. You that that doesn't make any sense at all. All right. Well, that'll do it for today's episode of Struck. If you're new to the show, thank you so much for listening and please leave a review and subscribe on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Check out the WeatherGuard Lightning Tech YouTube channel for video episodes, full interviews, and short clips from the show. And follow us on LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Our handle is at WG Lightning. Tune in next Tuesday for another great episode on aviation, aerospace engineering, and lightning protection. Strike Tape, WeatherGuard Lightning Tech's proprietary lightning protection for radomes, provides unmatched durability for years to come. If you need help with your radome lightning protection, reach out to us at weatherguardaero.com. That's weatherguardaero.com.